I'm going to uh, paint some fairly broad sweeping strokes just to give you a primer of hyperbaric oxygen therapy as a foundation for uh, medical research. Uh, first, I just want to tell you a bit about our own chamber complex because if we're going to be doing research here, one needs to understand our logistical situation. The chamber here was built in 2004. There was a chamber here since 1965, but this is a newly commissioned chamber designed and built locally. We have a two-bed resuscitation bay in a three-lock configuration. The chamber is 27 feet long and 9 feet in diameter. It's a fairly large complex. There are actually um, uh, two treatment locks. One is fully commissioned and being used. The second the treatment lock is not fully commissioned but would not require much to commission it. The chamber is rated to 105 PSI, which is 237 feet of seawater. The chamber is pressurized with air, not oxygen, being a multi-place chamber. Um, and it's pressurized with these two large... Uh, low-pressure, oil-free compressors that's in our back room. The chamber itself, the main treatment lock, lock one, will seat eight patients, uh, so actually eight persons, which would be seven patients and one tender, and the smaller lock, which would be the research lock, has capacity for five. Uh, we can also accommodate two stretchers in our main lock. Um, we have full ICU capabilities with uh, physiologic and environmental monitoring. Patients generally uh, sit in a chair and breathe oxygen in a hood. Uh, the environment in that hood is 100% oxygen. The environment in the chamber is air. The ex exhaled gases are, uh, go through an overboard dump system, so the exhaled gases from the hood do not enter the chamber. Uh, chamber movements are controlled by a delta V control system. This is a modified steam plant system, actually. Uh, so um, there are two parallel computers that run um, together. If one goes down, the other takes over. If we go offline with power, uh, there's backup with generator. If that goes down, there's four-hour battery backup. And if that goes down, we have manual controls because we don't trust computers. So we can get in and out of any dive with manual controls inside or outside the chamber. And that's required for safety, obviously. You'll see we have backup on backup on backup. Uh, fire suppression is an important part of hyperbaric practice. This is the fire suppression system in the back room. We have two large uh, pressure uh, capacitance vessels. These are storage vessels for stored air, so if our compressors go down, we can do any dive, any two dives in and out. And the red tanks are the water tanks, which are the deluge and the handline system for the interior of the chamber. Uh, fire suppression is important because lacking a fire suppression system, this can be the result. This is the Milan chamber, where 11 people died in Italy um, because of an unrecognized, uh, probably an uh, oxygen leak in the chamber and a source of ignition. Um, the medical director of this chamber is actually still in prison because in Italy they don't have malpractice, they have jail terms. So there are 13 diagnoses which hyperbaric oxygen is currently used for in British Columbia. These are the 13 diagnoses sanctioned by the UHMS, the Underwater Hyperbaric Medical Society, for which there's felt to be sufficient evidence to justify its use. And we're fortunate in British Columbia that any of these 13 diagnoses are covered by MSP, whereas in Ontario and many other provinces they are not. So we're quite unique in that um, these are the 13 diagnoses, just run through them quickly. There's air or gas embolism, carbon monoxide poisoning, gas gangrene. The acute traumatic peripheral ischemia is, is a catch-all phrase, including uh, crush injury, compartment syndrome, etc. Uh, decompression sickness, DCS, enhanced wound healing, which is primarily diabetic and ischemic ulcers. Exceptional blood loss anemia, so patients who either cannot or will not be transfused because of uh, either their personal convictions or multiple incompatibilities. Uh, can be maintained uh, for a week or two until they can generate their own red cell mass. Intracranial abscess, uh, neck fash, refractory osteomyelitis, and then delayed radiation injury, which is what we're talking about primarily today, of bone or soft tissue, compromised skin grafts and flaps and thermal burns. We have two parallel programs at BGH. There's an elective program which runs five days a week, usually two dives per day and six patients per dive. So we'll service about 75 patients per year in that elective program and provide about 2,500 uh, dives. And there's also a 24-7 emergency program where we'll provide care for another 75 patients or so. And so the combined treatments for the year run between 2,500 and 3,000 patient treatments per year. These are the diagnoses, uh, the numbers of the diagnoses we've treated in the past 21 months. You can see that delayed radiation injury is our number one diagnosis. Carbon monoxide poisoning is number two. That would go down if people would stop heating their homes with charcoal briquette fireplaces when the power goes out and they would stop running generators in their bedrooms when the power goes out, and if they would stop locking trucks in garage while they clean carpets, as they did uh, this week and killed two people in Vancouver, unfortunately. Uh, DCS, we treat about uh, 20 to 30 patients with DCS a year, problem wounds, and the list goes down from there. Um, one needs to understand that there are complications and side effects of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. 
about a third of our patients, we seem to experience refractive changes, which are temporary myopia. It resolves usually after the th end of therapy, but not in every case. Barotrauma occurs in about 10%. That's mostly in what we call an ear squeeze. And about 10% of our patients have myringotomy in tubes in order to complete therapy. Um, in the head and neck cancer patient, that is skewed, so it might be a little lower in the population that we're considering today. Confinement anxiety is a term that we use for claustrophobia, because claustrophobia you can't control, whereas confinement anxiety you can. Uh, seizures occur about 1.3 per 10,000 exposures. Some authors believe it's more like 1 in 3,000. Um, it is possible to have a secondary gas embolism if the chamber is traveling when the seizure occurs. That isn't usually a problem in the multi-place chamber because when the chamber is traveling, the patients are usually on air, not oxygen. Rarely a patient with a low ejection fraction can experience an exacerbation of CSF and a flash pulmonary edema, and gas embolism is a, always a problem with decompression. There was a gas embolism case in Victoria a few months ago, a young, healthy Navy diver having a pressure test traveling from 100 feet. Um, was breathing properly, but clearly gas trapped and ended up with a cerebellar infarct. Uh, catastrophic hull or port failure can occur. Contaminated breathing gas source can occur. Excessive depth uh, and a hood or mass malfunction can occur. And these are not just theoretical. Uh, these really can happen. I had the exciting experience of having a mask go uh, fully negative while applied to my face at uh, uh, one atmosphere of uh, depth, and I had one atmosphere of negative pressure applied to my face. Uh, it wasn't pleasant. Uh, so these things can happen um, if there's a constellation of events that leads to a misadventure. One of the neat things about hyperbaric medicine is all the new lingo you get to use. So we have this nomenclature. We have the chambers called the chamber, and we have a dive, a spinal hit, the bends, the chokes, the staggers, and the pops, all clinical entities that happen to divers. Does anyone know what, hap what it's called if a, if a diver gets a spinal hit, the bends, the chokes, the pops, staggers all at once, in one day, one dive? That's called the shits, but it's spelled S-C-H-I-T-S, so it's, it's not a swear word. <laughs> this is a, this is a, a mark. Uh, this, this is a hard hat. This is a hard hat was built in, uh, in 1946. And this is interesting because you have a, a rigid helmet and a, and, a, and a flexible canvas suit. And so uh, this is an illustration of we deal with pressure all the time. And, and uh, in the chamber, pressure can hurt you, which is one of the logistical things we need to deal with and do research. If you're wearing this suit, this, this is a real case now, a diver in the East River wearing a suit just like this. If your non-return valve in the suit's not installed properly and someone opens your air source at the surface to air, they will find your soft body parts 12 feet up the air hose. So pressure can hurt you. One needs to be careful dealing with it. We talk about pressure in terms of atmospheres or feet of seawater. One atmosphere is 33 feet. We're all now in one atmosphere of pressure. And so if one goes 33 feet down in the chamber, you're now at two atmosphere in the chamber. So we talk about our dive at 2.4 atmospheres being 45 feet of seawater, and that is our clinical dive that we would use for these kinds of patients. And this is the profile that we use. You can see we have uh, 10 minutes of travel to 45 feet, and then the patients breathe oxygen for, for 90 minutes in total, 30 minutes at a time with air breaks. We then travel to 20 feet where our tender uh, does decompression because our tender breathing nitrogen in the air has become a carbonated beverage in the chamber. And if you uncork a carbonated beverage too quickly, it bubbles, it fizzes. And so the tender has to be uncorked slowly. They travel to 20 feet, breathe oxygen, and then travel to 10 feet, and then breathe some more, and then they come up. This is an illustration of the physical effect of pressure on a bubble. You can see that at one atmosphere, you have double the pressure, so the volume of a bubble has, has halved. And this is not important so much in elective patients, but this is part of the pathophysiology of how hyperbaric oxygen works, especially in dealing with DCS and gas embolism. And at six atmospheres, the you have six times the pressure, so the volume of the bubble is one sixth what it would be at the surface. However, that does have an effect on gas filled spaces in the body. So, for example, a person who is going down in the chamber, coming up in the chamber, will have a change in volume of gas in trapped spaces. Um, uh, and so, and then at the same time, if you, if you go to depth and you fill your, for example, your sinuses with air, and then you travel to the surface, if you are not able to evacuate that air from the gas filled sinus, you'll get expansion. An example of this, I saw a patient who was referred to us because he'd been scuba diving and had, res uh, had what we call a reverse squeeze. So at depth, his maxillary sinus blocked, uh, sorry, his mastoid sinus blocked. He, he came up, but uh, the air couldn't get out the normal avenue, so it fractured into his cranium. And he presented with a headache and pneumocephalus. He was referred to us. Obviously, we didn't dive him. It would be a contraindication to diving him. He was admitted to neurosurgery for a few days and sent home with instructions to never, ever, ever go scuba diving again. I saw him in emergency two weeks later with a headache after skydiving. And the CT scan demonstrated more air in his head, and he truly was an airhead. This is an example of what happens in the, in the middle ear with exposure to pressure. 
you know, pressure builds up in the external auditory canal because we have the ambient pressure in the chamber. The middle ear space ordinarily needs to ventilate through a nasopharynx through the eustachian tube. If that fails to happen, there's a pressure differential across that dependent membrane, and that causes pain. We call that an ear squeeze. Here's an example of a person with no ear squeeze. There's a moderate ear squeeze and a severe ear squeeze, so it can be a serious condition that we encounter on occasion. So this can all cause barotrauma. So gas trapped in a space doubles in volume as you go from 33 feet to the surface, and that can cause things like pneumothorax gas embolism and sinus fracture, as I've, as I've illustrated. Also, it can cause decompression sickness in your inside tender. So our staff, logistically, we have challenges. Our staff can only dive for so long so often because our, our tenders are at risk for DCS, and the incidence of DCS in inside tenders is about the same as that in recreational divers. The first patient we treated in our chamber, newly commissioned in November 2004, was an inside tender from a local private chamber who got bent at work, so it can happen. Uh, and the gas loading is a function of time and depth. You become a carbonated beverage, so it needs one, one needs to be uncorked um, fairly slowly. And there have been misadventures, for example, uh, uh, six people died uh, due to a misadventure where uh, depth gauges were converted from feet of seawater to meters during a routine maintenance. It was unrecognized, and the excessive depth uh, caused uh, six fatalities. Uh, so, what does all this mean in terms of physiology when you add oxygen to it? Well, if you breathe 100% oxygen at three atmospheres, or 2.8 atmospheres, for example, you will dissolve enough oxygen in your plasma to sustain life, to, beat your, to meet your basal metabolic rates in the absence of hemoglobin, enough oxygen is dissolved in plasma. This was illustrated by this fairly uh, quaint uh, study uh, done in 1960 where um, pygmy swine were exsanguinated in a hyperbaric chamber, actually exchanged transfused with plasma in a, in a chamber. And um, these pygmy swine survived in a hyperbaric environment with no hemoglobin. Uh, the, the story goes they were actually then re-exchanged transfused and, and sold to a local, local butcher. Obviously, the study's not been repeated in humans, but if you can find the right subjects, it'd be interesting. And if it works for pygmy swine, I'm pretty sure it'll work for lawyers. I'd like to do that one someday. But. So in this environment, then, you have pressure, you have oxygen. The PO2 of these people at 3 HEA is in excess of 2,000. So your PO2 is greater than 2,000 in the chamber on oxygen. Your capillary PO2 sitting in this room now is in the order of probably 40, 50, 60, depending on a variety of physiologic factors. But in the chamber, your PO2 is between 250 and 500 capillary. Now that produces a huge oxygen diffusing gradient so that under normal conditions, you can diffuse oxygen about 64 microns from your capillaries into your tissue interstitium. In the chamber, you can diffuse it about 250 microns or more. So in a hypovascular, hypocellular, hypoxic tissue, it can drive oxygen across this greater distance. And that's why it's good for conditions like delayed radiation effect. It also caused things like vasoconstriction and reduced blood flow in a variety of tissues, including the brain. However, because you have streaming of oxygen-laden plasma through areas of relative stasis, it does not cause tissue hypoxia or ischemia because you have this loaded plasma going through. Then there are a variety of other effects. And just briefly, again, one could spend two hours on each of these discussing just how this works. But there is enhanced phagocytic uh, killing of white cells, there's, uh, or by white cells. There's a direct bactericidal and static effect on certain bacteria. Uh, there's inhibition of alpha toxin production in gas gangrene. There's a decrease in inflammatory response uh, in uh, decreased white cell adhesion, uh, decreased endothelial adhesion. And all of this results in an inhibition of the uh, reperfusion injury, the no reflow effect that one sees after ischemia of tissues. And there's an effect on irradiated tissue. And this is, this is the important thing that we're going to talk about today or, or one, of the, one of the side issues that we deal with. Tissue that's been irradiated is hypovascular, hypocellular, and hypoxic because the radiation kills blood vessels, primarily capillaries and other, but causes an obliterative end arteritis. Um, tissue requires an average PO2 of about 30 millimeters of mercury in order to heal. And the problem is that in the absence of oxygen, the steps of collagen deposition and then, and then capillary ingrowth can't occur in the lacking that basic uh, oxygen grade, uh, amount. And an oxygen gradient between healthy and injured tissue is important as a stimulus to capillary ingrowth. And the problem is that uh, without that angiogenesis, healing doesn't occur. And that, those two things are lacking in tissue that's been irradiated. So for example, normal PO2 capillary, say 50. This is a schematic, obviously. Injured tissue is much lower. But if one, if one looks at the tissue surrounding the injury, you have sufficient 
amount of oxygen for collagen deposition for the matrix, and you have sufficient gradient as a stimulus to capillary ingrowth. In the tissue that's been irradiated, one lacks the baseline oxygen levels for matrix deposition, and one lacks the gradient between tissue that's been irradiated and tissue that's been injured. So it will not heal if injured, it may break down spontaneously. In a hyperbaric environment, one restores that oxygen in the ischemic penumbra around the injured tissue that's been irradiated. You've restored the baseline oxygen, you've restored the gradient, and if this is applied in a pulse of once or twice per day, this is a stimulus to capillary ingrowth and healing is initiated. So that is very briefly uh, what would be a textbook of hyperbaric physiology in 10 minutes. Okay? Now, the applications of this modality to urology in general, before we talk about the, the um, uh, applications in, in uh, research, would be primarily in radiation cystitis. We're now treating two or three patients with radiation cystitis, and it has been uh, demonstrated by a variety of authors to be effective in actually treating this condition in 80 to 100 percent of cases, depending on when they're presented, and depending on the severity of the disease and the age of the patient, probably to some extent. So response tends to correlate, we think, with beginning therapy within six months of presentation of hematuria, and we, there's some evidence that it may be more effective in the younger patient. However, even in patients with fairly advanced disease, hyperbaric oxygen can still be quite effective. It's better if we see people earlier, though. It, it is possible that there is a de deterioration in response beyond 24 to 48 months. Uh, one study suggested that if one looks at five or 10 years down the road, only a third of patients have a sustained response. However, in their cohort, no one had repeat treatment. In other studies in which repeat treatment was offered, uh, there is a secondary response that you can then once again recover some, uh, some uh, bladder integrity by treating a second time. I must add there's no conclusive evidence that hyperbaric oxygen is proneoplastic. This is an area of some controversy and some study, but there's no conclusive evidence. And the general consensus at this point is that one need not worry about giving hyperbaric oxygen to a patient who has residual disease. One is probably not going to accelerate the, the, uh, the growth of the residual tumor. Radiation proctitis is the other condition that we commonly treat. Uh, the response here is not quite as dramatic as radiation cystitis. About half, of, half the patients will have a, a resolution of their bleeding. And these, this is in a cohort of patients who have failed other medical, surgical, endoscopic therapy. It's important to note. Um, and about 28% uh, have fewer episodes. So about 75-80% uh, of people have some positive response. 75% uh, of reduced pain. In this cohort, no patients had a complete resolution of pain, but certainly quality of life has improved significantly. And about half have resolved or reduced ulceration. So again, it's a fairly effective modality with about two-thirds of patients having a, a positive response. So the general protocol for treating a patient with radiation injury, which would be the same protocol that we would use for treating patients with ED would be 90 minutes of oxygen at 2.4 atmospheres, 30 minutes at a time with five minute air breaks. And we treat them generally five times a week is what we would ordinarily do, in once or possibly twice a day. Um, we currently are treating once a day, but we're considering moving to a BID option. And most of the patients that we treat require 40 to 60 treatments, certainly for radiation cystitis. Uh, 40 is, is the baseline at which we start, we're prepared to go to 60 if we need to. Now, there are some logistical challenges in doing research, and I'll just touch on these, and then we'll talk about this more at the end and, and have questions at the end. This, pro this requires a prolonged course of therapy. This isn't one injection or one pill or one surgical procedure. This requires a time treatment on the part of the patient of coming to the chamber, either for half a day or a whole day, for 20 or 30 or 40 treatments. And in the chamber, they're the two and a half hours. Really, it's going to consume their morning or their afternoon or both of its BID. Uh, there's also limited space in the chamber, so one needs to run this kind of program in parallel with an already completely full elected program. Fortunately, we have the second chamber, which is, which is sitting there, almost commissioned, not being used. You won't find very many hyperbaric chambers in the world that have an empty chamber waiting to do research. But what this requires is basically to double our capacity in the chamber complex from our current patients of 75 per year, if only to do this on an ongoing basis, uh, to run a research chamber in parallel, one is really talking about doubling your throughput. Um, and so that, logistically, that's a, that's a fairly big challenge. 
The other thing to consider, is blinding possible? Can one blind patient do a sham treatment? That is very cumbersome. There's some evidence that you can pressurize the chamber to three or four feet of seawater, the patient's ears will pop, and then a naive patient will think they've been compressed, they won't really know. However, you're still committing a patient now to a course of therapy, a placebo, that might run four, six, eight weeks of half of their day, five days a week as a placebo. That's going to be a hard sell to the patient and to ethics. So there are some logistical challenges in terms of constructing um, prospective studies, which is why there is, a, there is a vacuum in prospective randomized clinical trials in hyperbaric medicine. The vast majority of what one sees is retrospective, and this is only, I've only really just brushed the surface of the challenges that we face in the logistics of providing uh, or doing this kind of research. So that's all I really want to say at this point. I think we'll just we'll go on now. To